Hello, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours with your host, Stephen Jones of Lightbox Homes, based here in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Office Hours is the real estate investing show where I kind of take your questions about real estate investing and uh, field them as if you were walking into your professor's office in college uh, to discuss whatever topic he was teaching at that time. Uh, this is not to presume that I am, uh, you know, a board certified PhD in real estate investing, but I do have four years of experience, uh, more than two dozen houses uh, renovated and sold, and uh, we got five projects running right now. So if anything, I am a source of inspiration or experience that you can lean on uh, when getting started or handling your own rehab projects. Uh, one minute, gotta get the door. So, once again, feel free to ask me any questions that you have today. Um, I'm going to launch into my topic because it's kind of awkward just to um, stand in front of a camera and wait for people to ask questions. That's not going to work. Might as well start giving you some value right now. So what I was going to talk about today uh, were what I call blind spots. And uh, blind spots refers to the things that you can't see when you're looking at the property that you're thinking of buying. And there's quite a few, and they love to sneak up and get you and take twenty, thirty thousand dollars off your bottom line, and that's not a good thing. So, uh, with no further ado, I will begin talking about that. Unless you guys got some questions, I also have a, um, a quiz on my Facebook page about this. So, by all means, you know, let me know what is your biggest worry when uh, looking at a potential real estate property. So, let me see. So, let's see here. So we're talking today about, make sure I got this lined up right, blind spots. You know, like the classic example is when you're driving and um, you have a blind spot. It's a place that you cannot see easily on the right side of your car. So if there's another car there, you might not be able to see them in your mirror uh, and you might hit them if you change lanes. So in real estate, I refer to things uh, such as, um, you know, gotchas like, you know, uh, UDCs or um, HOAs, things like that, stuff that you don't necessarily think about when you're buying the property. Uh, one of the first ones I want to talk about, because I know a lot of new investors um, fall for this one a lot, is square footage. So that'll be our first blind spot. So square footage, you know, and uh, the classic example is people who buy, say, in uh, Kirkwood or um, Reynolds Town or Edgewood, any of these hot neighborhoods, sometimes they'll pay too much for not enough square feet to build the house that they want. You know, they, they might be expecting to do an all interior renovation uh, when in fact the house needs an addition. And uh, they, won't, they won't notice this because it's, maybe the house seems like it's at a good price. You know, Kirkwood is like a uh, $500,000 neighborhood. What if somebody offered you a property for two seventy five dollars there? <gasps> wow, that's 50% of ARV. How could I go wrong? I just make a quick 3-2 out of it and boom, I'm done. It's ready to go, 100000 in. So 250 plus 100 is 350 Gross profit margin is... Wow, $150,000, that's a lot. Except that what you don't realize is that those comps that are selling for 500 are 1,500 square feet. And the house you just bought is 800 square feet. So you're gonna have to add 700 square feet to that house to reach those comps. So now your budget just went from $100,000 to $175,000. And where's your profit gone? Into the pocket of the wholesaler or the seller who sold you that property. So you need to be aware that sometimes square footage can be a blind spot. And sometimes it's not quite as extreme an example of that. You know, uh, sometimes you buy a house that's maybe 1,100 square feet and you walk in, you're like, yeah, I could kind of shove this into here and, you know, I'll make a vertical laundry room instead of a laundry, I mean, a laundry closet instead of a laundry room. And, oh, uh, you know, kitchen doesn't have to be that big, you know? I don't need a half bath all these things and you kind of rationalize it to yourself 
And then as you get into the project, you realize, uh, I still got to add two or 300 square feet to this house. Otherwise, it's going to be too small and nobody's going to want to buy it. And in many cases, people don't even discover that until they are on the market with the finished property and nobody wants to buy it. And all the feedback they're getting are things like, your master bedroom is too small. A 12 by 12 bed bedroom is not a master bedroom. Your master bath, too small. You know, 36 square feet is not going to cut it for a master bath, especially in a $500,000 neighborhood. You know, they'll get things like the layout is messed up. Like you have to put the kitchen in a wacky place or do something bizarre, uh, like do a peninsula. People hate peninsulas. Um, there's other weird things that happen when you try to shove too much house into too small a property. So that's our first blind spot. Second blind spot I want to talk to you about are uh, lot blind spots. And these things can include stuff like the big one is sewer lines, you know. So here you got, you got your nice square lot, right? And you got this house right here, and you just paid $250,000 for it. It's in Grant Park. You're like, wow, I got a property in Grant Park for $250,000. This is awesome. All I got to do is add another level to the top, and everything's going to be fine. And then site development comes back to you when you're in permitting and says, hey, um, you know, you're going to have to move that sewer line. And you go, sewer line? What sewer line? You mean the one going to the house? And they're like, no, 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 that one's fine. The 12 inch pipe passing under the house that crossed over 285. I mean, sorry, crossed over I 20, goes right underneath your house on its way towards Grant Park. Do you see the blank look on my eyes? That's the blank look you give site development when you realize that you just got bent over and by a wholesaler. Many cases, especially properties that are close to major highways, sewer lines traverse the property. And we're not talking about like, you know, a wheel beating little PVC pipe that just carries a few little mojoncitos every now and then. No, folks, we're talking about the big stuff that takes everybody else's crap down to the uh, processing station. And the government has this funny rule about sewer pipes that run over your, under your property. If they break, the government can tear up whatever is on top of that sewer pipe to fix it. Doesn't matter. House, doesn't matter. They'll just tear it out. Usually it's driveways and things like that. Like uh, we had a lot uh, in um, East Atlanta that was completely worthless because there was a sewer line right down the middle of it. It was great for green space. But we knew that if we were going to build anything, and they told us this, by the way, they were going to build anything on that lot, my friends, if they need to repair it, everything coming out, they don't even have to ask you permission. Just get out of your house. We need to tear it down and fix this pipe. So understand that before you buy a property that's near a highway, you need to go into the site development office of your permitting jurisdiction and ask them to look up their sewer map and make sure there's not a pipe passing under your property. In city of Atlanta, that's site development. They have a specific form they have to fill out. You leave it with them and they email you a map a few days later. With DeKalb County, it is a building over there off of Memorial Drive, uh, just outside of the perimeter. And a nice, kindly old man will sit down and look everything up and show it to you. You need to do this. This is a blind spot that many people don't see. Sometimes even wholesalers don't see it. They're selling the house, and they don't even know that. So go look that one up. That's a big one. There are other utilities that could possibly pass under your property. So you want to be aware of these things. That's a big blind spot. The next one I might talk about, kind of in that same sort of site development uh, range, is Water, water is a huge problem. So what we call riparian issues. So if you have like a stream 
that's like passing like right here and your house is right here. You guys should draw that in a different color. I'll draw that in black. Hopefully you guys can see, you guys can see, right? So here's your house, here's the stream. Around that stream, there is a boundary that you cannot build without permission. And there's a boundary that you cannot build, period, unless you are, you know, God. That first boundary that, you know, only God can build is the 25-foot buffer zone. And it goes on both sides of the stream. And within that area, you can build absolutely 100% nothing without permission from the EPD, from the Georgia Department of Environmental Planning. And guess how many permits they issue to do that per year? Like, none. You might as well be, you, you, it's not going to happen. Now, there are other, there's a 50-foot boundary, and there's a 75-foot boundary. If, either, if your house is within either of those two boundaries, in the city of Atlanta at least, you have to get special permission to build there, to do anything there. For us, on that Blake Avenue property, we were within the 75-foot boundary. We wanted to put a second level on the house, so we had to go get a variance from the city, from our neighbors, permission to do that. Even though we weren't disturbing any soil, we weren't doing anything wrong, we still had to go get that variance. It took seven months to get that variance, paying $2,000 a month in interest on the loan we used to buy that property. So realize that if you're within that distance to a riparian boundary, you're going to have a lot more time getting the permits required to build there. Now, and I want to point something out. On our stream here on Blake Avenue, it didn't even look like a stream. It didn't look like a creek. It looked like a freaking drainage ditch. And I thought to myself, at first, eh, it's no big deal. It's just a drainage ditch. It handles rainwater. It's not a big deal. And the city site development had me go get a flood study. So if you're getting a survey on your land, that's, that's what you're asking for, is a flood study. And the flood study came back, and guess what it showed? That that wasn't a drainage ditch. It was a riparian environment, and I had to go get permission. All right? So realize that. Big blind spot is water. Don't think that it's not a riparian environment because it looks like a drainage ditch. By all means, you want to make sure you get that checked out. All right. So... Uh, next blind spot, city boundaries. And this is a calculating ARV blind spot. So you want to make sure you get this one right, folks. I might need to erase this. Hang on. Big blind spot here. Let's see here. So this one is city boundaries. Everybody knows that when you say you've got a Decatur property for sale, that can mean one of two things. City of Decatur and not City of Decatur. And even if you're not into real estate investing, you're just a resident here of Atlanta, you've lived here six months, you know that there's a difference between City of Decatur and regular Decatur. And it's about a $500,000 difference. Yes. That 3-2 you've got off of Candler Road on White Oak, Going to sell for three forty-five. dollars It's got three bedrooms, two baths, plus a loft with a full bath. So it's kind of like a 4-3. It's beautiful. If it had only been a half mile further north on Candler, in the city of Decatur, it would be worth more than half a million dollars. No joke. And that's a pretty extreme example. That's probably the most obvious example. That's what most people living in the Atlanta area are going to think of when they think of this. But in that same area... There are other considerations. You know, if you're looking at that one specifically, if this is Candler Road and this is Memorial, if you're here, you're an unincorporated cab. Sorry, I had a phone call there. If you're here, you're an unincorporated cab. If you're here, you're in the city of Atlanta. And once again, there's a huge difference in ARV. Here, this house, 345, right? Here, probably more like 425. That's a huge difference. You've got to be aware of that. That when you're an unincorporated cab, you're in a different school system. And all I did was cross the street 
You could throw a rock from one house to the other, and there's a nearly $80,000 difference in ARV. It's that extreme. So when you're looking at deals from wholesalers or realtors, uh, or even talking to a seller about comps, make sure you're comparing apples to apples because the difference can be very, very big. It can be huge, folks. That's a big blind spot. Got any questions, by the way, right now? Anybody got any questions? Anybody got anything they want to say here? Any questions here? Let me see here. Da, 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 da. Ain't nobody what, writing me questions. Anybody on this thing, or am I just talking to myself? I'm just talking to myself. It's all right. I'll keep going. This has got some value for somebody down the road. Folks, I'm going to put all this, these videos on YouTube so that uh, you guys can continue to use this as a reference. Uh, and, and check back in and, and use this information later on down the road. So once again, talking about blind spots. Next blind spot's gonna be uh, the street itself. All right, so let's see. The street itself. So what do I mean by that? Well, as many of you know, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these deals happen in transitional areas. Areas that were once kind of depressed socioeconomically, but now are on the up and up. They're being gentrified because all these young people with good paychecks coming out of Georgia Tech and Georgia State, and uh, they, they want to live close to their jobs in the tech sector. They want to live along the belt line. And a lot of those neighborhoods have not been invested in in decades. And so you have, you know, a lot of street walkers. You have people selling drugs out of their house. You have, you know, problems with crime, problems with, you know, break-ins, things like that. These are transitional neighborhoods. But, but, there are pockets of transitional neighborhoods that are, you know, nicer. You know, people have more, there's more homeowners there instead of renters. Maybe people have a higher um, pride of ownership there and they keep that up. Maybe they keep a good watch out for bad guys on the street, you know. Um, or maybe that, that street has been rehabbed. For a long time there's a lot of rehabs on that street and so the street looks nice the very next street or even the same street 300 yards down it's got a drug house it's got a prostitution house it's got sketchy scary looking dudes walking around you know all the time carrying 40s or whatever it's got gun violence down that way or something like that it can literally be block by block and you might not even know it you might go visit that property at 12 o'clock on a Monday. Everybody on that side of the, everybody in that part of the street is asleep. But then you buy the property and you decide to bring your wife there one afternoon, show her what a great buy you had. And my God, it looks like The Walking Dead is being filmed on the street. You know? So you've got to understand that that's going to make a difference to your buyers. The people buying your properties are going to see that kind of thing. You know, and I've seen people that I respect who couldn't sell a property in the summer because there's a bunch of people, you know, drinking 40s on their, on their doorstep across the street and looking scary. And then in the winter when those people did all their drinking inside, how sold? Because the buyers didn't know. <laughs> so understand that this could be a problem sort of like a double yellow line that money can't solve. So you definitely want to make sure that when you're looking at a property, you know, drive it at different parts of the day, drive it on the weekend, you know, really get a feel for what street you're buying on. And for those of you buying from out of town, if you're investing from California or Illinois or New York, hire a realtor and tell them to go drive it at different times and see how the street really is. Don't buy blindly based on numbers on paper that will not help you, especially in the softening market. All right? So yeah, watch out for the zombies. Very nice. <laughs> hey, Ernesto. Yeah, Ernesto knows what I'm talking about. The, the, the zombies walking down the street, you know, looking for uh, loose lawnmowers to pick up. You, they can impact your ability to sell your house quickly. Ask anyone who sold a house in 30311 or 30310 in Cascade, Bush Mountain, those areas of the west side, they are street by street. Do not pay full price until you have seen the street. Okay, next, the market. The market itself. So the market, let me uh, write this down here. All right. The 
before she leaves, I might bring my wife in here also to uh, talk about uh, rehabbing blind spots. Uh, hold on, let me actually just tell her to kind of think of some. Hold on. Hey, Elena. Can I bring you in a few minutes to talk about things people don't see in the house? Like, in the house, like during renovation? You don't have to, just think of some stuff. You don't have to come now, I'll think of you later. At the end of my show. You might write down a few things nobody sees. Yeah, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I don't know if she'll make it in here or not, but I'll, I'll keep talking. Um, okay, so the street itself. So the market. So the market right now is not what it was even a year ago. Those who know, those who watch it, uh, have been seeing an increase in inventory as lots of people like you and me come in and buy and renovate houses. And the buyer pool is shrinking. And it's not shrinking because, you know, everything is bad, everything's going to shit, the system is bad. It's just becoming more normal. There's um, a lot of people moving in from out of town, you know, rent first for a long time. There's a lot of competition from all the rentals that are coming up because, hey, in a rental, you don't have to take care of it. Somebody else does. You know, and a lot of millennials believe in renting as a sort of a hedge against the economy so that if things go south, at least they're not losing their house. You know, so you can kind of understand if you grew up watching your parents, you know, drink themselves to sleep every night in 2007, 2008, uh, you can kind of see where they're coming from. But so right now what we're entering is a more normalized market where the number of buyers and sellers is relatively even. And so there's a lot more competition among sellers to get your house sold quickly. So this is more pronounced in areas uh, in town where maybe a bunch of houses got bought by rehabbers and there's a ton of inventory on the market and you're gonna be competing against 10 other people who want that buyer for $330,000, 3-2. So um, looking at the whiteboard backwards, change frame left to right, what the heck? How do you even do that, Ernesto? Don't know how to read like <laughs> Okay, I won't use the whiteboard anymore, I'll just talk. Um, but yeah, you want to definitely have a realtor uh, do a market assessment, take a look at you know where uh, the market is, you know how how many houses are on sale, what's the price point, what do they offer, what's the square footage for the price point, you know. Then you want to drive the street and see how many more people are renovating in here, how much stuff is coming to market. You know, it's funny because a lot of wholesalers will pitch me a property with this. This street has rehabs going up all over the place. And I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to remove the blind spot of bad street. But what they can, in, in, a, in a normalized market, what it can mean is too much competition. You don't want that kind of competition. You really don't. Um, you want to be the nicest house at a reasonable price. So you need to start building that into your um, assessment. Okay, so uh, the next blind spot, historic neighborhoods. Uh, historic neighborhoods are places like the historic West End. And why they're a blind spot is, just like when I was talking about the street, your historic neighborhood could be here, one street over is not historic. A great example is the historic West End, where if you, uh, if you cross south, if you cross Lowry to the south, not historic anymore. And the difference is that your permitting process when in a historic neighborhood has to go through um, what's called a UDC. Uh, basically, it's a neighborhood planning unit that uh, sets expectations and code for how your house is going to look on the exterior. So, for example, in Historic West End, no vinyl windows. Sorry, you've got to get handmade custom wood windows to fit those openings that were set up in 1925. You know, you can't use certain colors, certain types of siding. It all has to be historical. Right? So that's going to add three months, maybe more, to your permitting process, and it's going to add real money to your renovation budget. So you need to be aware of that. There are other historic districts that you might not be aware of in places like Norcross, Duluth, you know, any kind of like area that has houses from the 1920s or turn of the century, you're probably going to run into this. So you definitely want to make sure, as part of your due diligence on a property, that you figure out what that permitting jurisdiction is, and make sure you're not in a historic district, or if you are, start interviewing other uh, investors like me who are in that district so that you can know um, 
what to expect at least. And you know, I will even take the, uh, the the next step, and I will go to that permitting district and ask them, "Hey, what's the process here? How long does it take? What do I need to show? Do you have the code that I can read?" By the way, whenever you need to, if whenever you have a hard time falling asleep, read some municipal code. <laughs> Pass out, man. So you'll pass out that fast. Uh, so, okay, so that's another blind spot. So definitely keep an eye on if you're in a historic district or not. If all the houses look really old and well kept up, there's a very good chance you are. So next, oh, and along the same line, HOAs. We bought a house in Hiram that was on an HOA, and that HOA required any kind of exterior permitting, exterior changes to be permitted. So... We didn't do that. <laughs> we didn't know about it till the end. And they were kind enough to us, but some HOAs aren't going to be kind to you. They'll fine you. They'll make you change it. They'll make you rip it off and change it. So if you're buying in a subdivision, if there's a gate in front of your property where it has some kind of name like Horseshoe Bend or you know Sugarloaf Acres or something like that, definitely go look at one of the active or sold listings and check and see if they have an HOA. Get that HOA number off of the listing. Give them a call and figure out, what do I have to do to add to this house? Is it possible? Are there going to be a bunch of busy buddies looking my plans over and telling me yes or no to what I want to do? Check that out because that makes a big difference as far as your hold time is concerned, your budget is concerned, and your sanity is concerned. So that's a big blind spot as well. Let's see here. And last, I think I will talk about hazardous materials. A lot of houses in town are built, were built in the 1930s and 40s and 50s before people realized that asbestos causes cancer. And so they put asbestos siding and asbestos tile on the floor. And they put asbestos tape around all of their, like, you know, HVAC pipes. And in some cases, they use asbestos insulation in the walls. It's dangerous stuff. It will kill you. But worse than that, if you're a rehabber, it'll cost you an arm and a leg to take it out. The companies that are certified to basically like turn your house into that house from ET, they charge a ton of money to do it because they know they've got you by the toes, people. They got you by the short hairs. So do not mess with that. If you see wavy siding or some kind of tile on the floor that looks kind of old and sketchy, you might have asbestos in that house. You need to ask for a discount so you can pay that contractor to get it out of there. There are some workarounds. Uh, one of my favorite is if you don't have to add to the house, if you're not going to be cutting asbestos siding, just encapsulate it. Put siding on top of it. I mean, as long as it's not an aerosol, as long as it's not in dust form, asbestos is, you know, not as, not as dangerous. Not dangerous at all, really. But the minute you cut into it and make it a dust, it becomes incredibly dangerous. So if you're doing an addition onto a house with asbestos, you need to get a discount on that house. So learn, go online, Google it, learn what you're looking for. If you have any doubts at all, put DD in your contract, bring out somebody who knows, you know, make sure you've got a handle on that because that's a very expensive blind spot. Uh, same thing goes for lead-based paint. Our house on Piper Avenue, or Piper Avenue, in East Atlanta a few years back had lead-based paint on the outside of it. Guess what? We couldn't scrape it. We couldn't reuse that siding. You know, we, we had no choice with that siding because of that, that lead-based paint uh, test coming back positive. So realize these hazards can cost you. And since you're in transitional areas with properties built in the 1920s through 50s, you need to be aware of what these things look like. Go Google it, figure it out. Good stuff. Uh, da, 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 da. Let me see if Lena can think of anything else. I'll be right back. Lane is actually, uh, she's gone to the ladies' room for a second. But uh, does anybody have any questions? Anything that they'd like to uh, talk about? Hey, okay, so um, looks like Ernesto is asking, how is the Gwinnett market? Well, in my opinion, the Gwinnett market has some distinct advantages over the in-town market. And it's actually a market that I'm looking in. I've had mixed uh, results in Gwinnett. It has different challenges. Uh, I think one of the big problems that in-town has right now, and this is just my opinion, 
is that uh, traffic is going to be increasingly problematic. I mean, I was on the Beltline on Saturday night, and it was a zoo, people. A zoo full of people, just shoulder to shoulder in the restaurants, full of people. You know, and the Beltline is not going to have transit. City government doesn't have the nuts it takes to get that put in. They're not going to do it. So that area is just going to get more and more and more congested. So over time, it's going to start turning away people who want to live there because they don't want to live in congestion. And since nobody's going to do anything about transit, that's going to be a big problem for that area. The other problem right now that we're having, and I, I don't mean to make this political, um, but if the movie studios leave, if they boycott us, a lot of the market for these uh, three hundred to $600,000 homes in town is going to dry up. All those people are going to go with them. So that's bad. It's not just people in the tech sector, people in the medical sector, people downtown who want to live near their job. A lot of a lot of what's driving growth in the Atlanta housing market are people coming in from California who once couldn't afford a house because it was nine hundred thousand dollars for a freaking two bed to being able to afford a six hundred thousand dollar four three. Wow, it's a lot of house. And they'll buy it all day long. But if they leave, if they're chased out of the state, that market could get hit. So realize, also, there's a lot of inventory in there. But realize that Gwinnett is insulated against that. Not as many people in Gwinnett working in the film industry. You know, so that market is a little bit more insulated from that. Gwinnett has its own economy, its own sort of, um, its own community there. Uh, the challenges in Gwinnett are different. It's a strong school system. That's the best thing going for it. But that said, even in that school system, some schools are considered better than others. So it's like, you know, having 10 great racehorses, but one of them wins every single time. That's the one that's most desirable. So you still have to be aware of your school systems in Gwinnett, and you cannot rely upon greatschools.net or not .com or whatever it is. You cannot rely on words on paper to determine what those great Gwinnett school systems are. You need to go out and talk to realtors. You need to talk to people that have worked in that, in that system and say, hey, guys, what are the most desirable school districts here? I know all of them are good, but which ones are the best? Which are the ones that one people want? So you need to do a little bit more research into that. Also, there's a big difference in Gwinnett between gated communities and not gated communities. Huge ARV difference. I mean, you can see, you know, when we had that house at 416 Warren Road, that house was worth 200 grand. A quarter mile away, 3,000 square foot new construction was going for 500,000. So understand that your, your ARV in Gwinnett is really based upon how desirable your neighborhood is, you know, and the schools. But it's a, strong, it's a strong market out there. It's not super hot. It's having some of the same problems with buyer pullback and inventory that the rest of the market is having, but not quite at the same rate that in town is having. So, um, but yeah, but the good schools out there stabilize that market. Great question there, uh, Ernesto. Thanks a lot for it. Anybody else? Lazarus, man, you got a question for me? You got something you want to ask me about in uh, Atlanta real estate? Let's see here. Anybody else? Anybody on Facebook? What's this? Okay. I understand. Okay, so anyway, so here we are. Okay, so let me let me see if uh Lena Lena, you want to step in? Is there anything you want to talk about blind spot wise on the actual construction side? Okay. It's all right, it's just Facebook Live. So everybody, this is my wife Lena. She does project Hi. management oh my God. Uh, for um, <laughs> for our company. So whenever I buy a house, she comes in, she redesigns it, and she manages the team that I'm puts gonna it back together. You. She's gonna kill me. <laughs> uh, but you know, ten years of marriage, you can uh, you know cash in a few of your chips and uh, you know, ask your wife to come in and help educate the masses. Uh -huh. So I've been talking about you know blind spots in yeah. the market. You know, yeah. like. Square footage too small, sewer lines under your property, water near your property, yeah. city boundary problems, asbestos, mm -hmm. the street itself, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. the market, finding the gap, historic neighborhoods and HOAs. Would you say there's anything about a building itself besides asbestos or hazardous that you find people kind of miss 
when they walk a property? Oh, definitely structural issues. Oh. Uh, so, you know, like a structural issue, sorry, I'm just a mess. It's like, it's hard to see myself like. <laughs> uh, a structural uh, issues definitely is uh, a big I think that, you know, if you have, if you see any kind of cracking foundation or, the, uh, you know, cracking uh, walls, uh, you know, I always encourage people to check on that because. It's something that we typically miss. Um, uh, expect usually to have also all your joists under your bathrooms rotten. That's very typical for all houses. So always budget that no matter what, you when you open those tiles, it's going to be rotten. I mean, as 99% sure. How many times have you had to replace piers in a house, an old house? A couple of times we have to reinforce and we have to reinforce joists, like sister them for old joists or rotten joists. Um, that's typically not super expensive. Not people. something you see easily. Uh, but it's something that you don't you don't see. Yeah. yeah. And I always encourage to like get an inspector, an inspector before you sell so the way you cannot see those things uh, before you go into the market. Um, other things that we have encountered that usually uh, people don't budget for is like rotten cheating under your seat, under your uh, roof. So tell me how I know, you know, typically like, you know, your roof, you just like count that you're gonna change your shingles, you remove all your shingles, and suddenly all your cheating is che rotten. Cheating is all that plywood they put on top of the rafters. Yeah, and typically in all construction, it's just those like um, one by four or one by six pieces. They were like, they were not like, I just have full piece of uh, plywood, but they're just like little pieces. Those typically can be problematic. Um, if they're, you know, if they have, if they haven't been taken care, if their roof hasn't been. Would replaced. you say windows are a blind spot? I mean, we've had situations, right, where like they weren't the right size or something. No, windows. Mm -hmm. I mean, windows are something that you typically can't see, uh, and you know, make sure that if you're going to leave them, make sure they're operable or that you don't need them to be operable. I mean, some people have sold houses where windows are not operable. In fact, we have. Oh, those. I know a good one. What? Uh, permits if you're buying a rehab from somebody else who's getting out of a rehab yes. sometimes people yes. get into a rehab and then for whatever reason they decide to wholesale yeah. it midway through it make sure you go to your permitting agency yeah. and make sure they have all their permits there's not any stop work orders yeah. on what yeah. they're doing yeah. they haven't done anything wrong yeah yeah so just make sure yeah your permits and also if you're buying a lot also make sure that you have um, you know, if you don't need a variance, because some lots you do need a variance if your setbacks are too small. Yeah, you know? that's so right. So that's something that a I, lot I haven't of people even gotten have. the blind spots. Yeah. Around, oh, and septic tanks. Remember? Oh, yeah. We septic got hit on tanks. a big yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. Our second project, we put oh, a house yeah. thinking that it was connected to the sewer. And we were yeah. like, at first, we were like, yeah. We we're like, yeah, we're a genius. We bought a great house. And then one day, Lena calls me. She's like, You've got to see this. And I go over there and she's <laughs> yeah, like crying. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, oh yeah. no, we're screwed. It didn't turn out to be that bad, right? No, it didn't turn out to be that bad, but definitely it was scary. And it, we got lucky because the septic tank was in good shape and the buyers didn't care. But um, it's something that always makes sure that you you know that you're connected to the sewer and that your water sewer is public. You know, I mean, we've never encountered anything like that, but you know. Yeah, good things to check in your DD. Make sure you go to your um, jurisdiction, check the sewer maps, check yeah. and make sure everything's connected because if you're wrong, a septic tank can be a fifteen thousand yeah, dollar hit. It can be pretty can be expensive. Bad. I mean, it can be just a matter of cleaning it if it's in good shape, just like mm -hmm. what it was uh, in our case. But if you have to repair it, it can be definitely expensive. Yep, so that's right. Yeah, I think that, that's about I mean, it. yeah, there's, I'm sure we're missing something because it's like, it's so extensive when you're renovating and you will build this experience. But um, yeah, that's a little bit of the summary of things that you tend to miss. So thanks everybody for joining us on this episode of Office Hours with Professor Stephen Jones and Professor Lenamas Aldivia. Um, hope everybody's learned something. Please like, comment on, and share this video because the knowledge contained here could save you or a friend of yours or a family member of yours a lot of money and time because they've gotten this education. And of course, if anybody has any questions, run them by me. 
you know, private message me, contact me, go to my website, lightboxhomes.com and fill out the form. If you're interested in buying, selling, or investing in real estate, look me up as well. Lena and I run a very sharp outfit. Uh, we would love to help you achieve your real estate goals. Um, so uh, without any other questions, uh, I think this will do it for June 17th episode of Office Hours. Thanks again, everybody, for joining me. Why, wow, that was great.